welcome everybody uh, tonight. Uh, we are pleased uh, to uh, have you all here. Uh, our topic tonight is uh, a little bit provocative uh, intentionally. Uh, it, uh, it is, was Jesus a Christian? And uh, we're pleased tonight to have Dr. Lori Barron with us. And uh, before we get started, I just want to uh, read a land acknowledgement here. And um, so we just want to acknowledge uh, this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. And so, as I said, we're pleased to have Dr. Lori Barron with us tonight. She's the Assistant Professor of New Testament at St. Louis University. And her research inter uh, interests are everything uh, around Jesus and Judaism, the use of the Old Testament and the New Testament, and some of the parting of the ways between Judaism and Christianity. And tonight we're just going to explore some of those themes as we... Uh, as we have a, a light conversation, and uh, after a, a few uh, minutes of chatting, we're going to open it up to some Q&A from the audience. A uh, couple of housekeeping items. Um, Dr. Barron is here as part of a, a tribute to a professor here at, at Wycliffe College, uh, doc, Dr. Jakob Yotch. And so we do have a book draw this evening uh, for one of his books. And so if you want to use the QR code, and this is a pretty important book, I would say, uh, in, uh, in Jewish Christian um, theology. And uh, so if you are interested in maybe winning the book, just uh, fill out the form on the, on the QR code or going online. So uh, welcome, Dr. Barron. And uh, why don't you... Uh, share a little bit about how you got interested in this field in particular, uh, what kind of started you on the path to studying this kind of topic. Great. Thanks, Stephen. Can everybody hear me? Hello, everyone. It's wonderful to see you all here. Uh, anybody, was anybody here last night as well for the lecture? I think I see a couple of familiar faces. Hi. You came back for more. Excellent. Um, you know, if you're going to ask me, whoa, there I am. If you're going to ask me how I got involved in, my, in the interests of my academic study, then we've got to kind of go back even farther to how did I get interested in Jesus? Uh, because that is, you know, that was not something obvious for someone from my background. So just, I'll, I'll keep that short, but feel free to jump in and ask anything that I might leave out. Just, I was born and raised in a Jewish home in St. Louis. And, um, appreciated all the Jewish education I got when I was growing up. I knew and understood, you know, that we were kind of different from uh, a lot of the other people in our neighborhood who had Christmas trees. We didn't have one. Um, but there were a lot of things we did have uh, on, on holidays when, you know, when Christians were celebrating Easter. We had Passover, and in fact, that's coming up, right, just this next week. Uh, I will say there was a Jewish woman in my neighborhood growing up who sponsored the neighborhood Easter egg hunt. So, you know, Jews, we, we tend to really not have problems with Christian holidays. Jews enjoy Christmas. My, my uh, mom and I would drive in St. Louis over to Candy Cane Lane, which is set up every year by Ted Drews, Rosen Custard, and you drive through the neighborhood where they have just gone crazy with lights and, you know, giant balloon decorations and, you know, I think for the most part, most Jews, including, including us, we're just happy to be in America, in a place where we can practice our religion and enjoy the fact that we get Christmas off and other, other Christian holidays. But we still knew we were different. You know, I was uh, learning Hebrew by, by third grade, studying, preparing for my bat mitzvah which you may have heard of is, is like a, kind of like a Jewish confirmation. You get up and you read from, from Jewish texts for the first time. Um, it was great, and I feel like I kind of have to explain to you that I had a good Jewish childhood because there are plenty of Jewish people in my life who have asked me, you know, well, what terrible thing happened to you as a Jew that you would come to believe in Jesus? So no, it had nothing to do with that. 
uh, everything was fine. I do have to admit, though, I had, you know, a lot of curiosity about God from a very young age. Okay, I'm going to tell a different story than I told last night because some of you were here. Uh, I'm not making anything up. I'm just going to emphasize different things. Um, you know, my, my biological father passed away when I was seven. And so I was already a pretty sensitive kid. And um, I think that is probably what got me thinking a lot about God, you know, afterlife. What happens when people die? You know, where did daddy go? Um, if my father died, is my mom going to die? You know, and then what about me? Uh, and, 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 you know, just these basic existential questions from that moment, I think, really started to shape who I was. Um, going through the teenage, you know, teenage, I don't, know if, I don't know if students still do this anymore, but teenage existential crises, does that still happen in, in the younger generations? Like, who am I? Where am I? Who do I want to become? To me, all those things could only be answered if I knew what my, if I had a purpose. You know, if there's a God who has a purpose for my life, then I can figure out what I want to major in, for example. Um, but if there is no God, then it's, you know, is, is there any purpose to even being good or doing good? Is, is this kind of making any sense? I, mean, I was just sort of obsessed with these questions from a young age. In high school, an English teacher got me reading um, Albert Camus. Uh, okay, some people are smiling, so maybe you've been down this path. The Myth of Sisyphus, The Stranger. Uh, I'm not sure if I understood them, actually, but I felt them deeply. And the idea of the Myth of Sisyphus that so fascinated me was, you know, according to, I think, Camus, this, this Greek god, Sisyphus, was condemned to roll a giant boulder up to the top of a mountain only to have it, after all this exertion and all this time, it gets to the top and then it just proceeds to roll on the other side. And then he's got to go down the mountain, find the boulder again, and roll it up. And so what, what does that tell you about the meaning of life? Uh, it wasn't supposed to be depressing. I think Camus really wanted to insist it wasn't depressing, but I felt like it was. Um, that's, I have to, we all have a boulder in life to exert, we've got work to do, and you bring your own meaning to that task. And I just was like staring there with my hands on my hips, staring at the boulder lying on the ground and saying, I am not going to push you up the mountain. Uh, it just upset me uh, a lot. And so, uh, in addition to these existential concerns, I just, you know, I, I knew I had friends who were Christian. I knew that there were other people in the world who were, you know, had other beliefs. There were Buddhists, there were Hindus, there were Muslims. Um, some people were atheists. Who was right? Um, I know, you know, we live in a pluralistic world, and I, I didn't feel like I could say with intellectual integrity, well, maybe they're all right in their own way. I felt like I was hopelessly modern. I never have gotten to the whole postmodern um, mindset. It's, oh, they can't all be right. If there's a God, who is it? If there's a God, can I know that God? And if there's a God, um, oh, do they want to know me? I'd like to know them. Do they want to know me? And if they do, what, was, what does that look like? Uh, how can I know? How can I find out? Oh my gosh, I could talk about my existential crisis all day. I really, I still live in that world, and I feel like that's why I've come to enjoy teaching undergraduates, because I think a lot of them still, you know, are in that place, and I want to join them there and, uh, and help them figure out where they're going. Um, so to get to the Jesus part, to actually answer your question, you may only get to one question tonight. I'm sorry, Stephen. We'll do as many as we I'm, can. I'm kind of on a roll now, <laughs> and I've only had a couple sips of beer, so that, that doesn't explain it. Um, you know, I ended up... Uh, working at my, my first job after graduating from college was at the original Whole Foods Market in Austin, Texas, when they only had one store. And I did all kinds of things, you know, stocking shelves, uh, working the cash register. And I found myself working alongside a small group of Christians, one person in particular, who kept trying to engage me in talking about God. And I was like, okay, there's something going on with this guy. Okay, he's trying to convert me. I get it. I'll play along a little bit. You know, let me hear his sales pitch. I always like to hear a good sales pitch. But, you know, that wasn't even exactly right. I really sensed that um, he was very sincere about God. You know, it seemed like he had confidence in his relationship with God. He knew who God was. Uh, he, he knew who he was. 
And he seemed like he knew the Old Testament better than I did, which kind of got me a little bit, and this is a little unnerving. You know, sometimes when he found out I was Jewish, he would say things, well, you know, haven't you read in Isaiah, it says blah, 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 and I was like, yeah, but I hadn't. I didn't know what he was talking about. Yeah, why are you reading Isaiah? Um, Christian in the middle of Texas. Why are you reading Isaiah? Like, is that, that's not your Bible. Um, and I just, I felt something authentic there, and I thought, you know, it's great for him. I would like to know God the same way he does. So I'm going to start going to the synagogue again. Uh, I'm going to start, maybe I need to become an Orthodox Jew. Anything but think about Jesus, because, um, you know, Jews didn't believe in Jesus. End of story. And, you know, there were a lot of reasons why Jews still continue to not think Jesus is for them, and a big part of it has to do with the, the long, you know, I don't have to belabor this point, but the long uh, legacy of Christian anti-Judaism theologically and, and sometimes even anti-Semitism. Uh, I knew about that, so why would I want to be interested in a God that was responsible for the persecution of my ancestors? That was not appealing at all. But here was this guy showing love for the Jewish Bible, love for the Jewish people, and that made me want to read the New Testament for myself. Um, you know, and when I did, I talked about this last night, I was kind of surprised by what I found there. I really, I can't explain it except to say that I felt I had kind of like a little, mm, now they call it come to Jesus moment. Uh, I didn't know that, that that's what it was called back then. I, I just sensed, you know, okay, this is where you belong. This is what you needed to know. This is the missing piece. And I was like, but no, not Jesus, you know, anything but that because I can't, I can't become one of them and I can't go home and tell my parents I've become one of them. Uh, that's going to be really disturbing to them. But it's about, it was about truth with a capital T. You know, if Jesus is the truth, then okay. Maybe I was wrong about him. You know, maybe, maybe all this teaching that I've gotten over these years, maybe, maybe we missed something. And so I ended up um, praying with this one friend uh, that I had met at Whole Foods. Not at Whole Foods. That would be a really good story. But um, he, you know, he was trying just various ways. He could tell I was interested, but trying to pretend like I wasn't. We went to a park in Austin where we, got, we went into this amphitheater, and he put this cassette tape. Remember cassette tapes? He put this cassette tape of um, the Bible into like the sound system for this amphitheater and started playing like the Bible and, and then said, are you ready to say a prayer? And I said, yes. And the next thing I knew, I was, you know, praying uh, for Jesus to forgive my sins and asking uh, for him to be my sacrifice, uh, to come into my life and change me uh, in the name of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was like all this, the Jewish stuff and the Christian stuff kind of came together uh, in that one moment. And um, yeah, that was, that was the big turning point, just that one moment. And I, I can, as, as sometimes even though I would want to maybe uh, deny sometimes that that actually happened, it did. Uh, and um, then I became a total fanatic. Any other fanatics in here? Anyone have like an adult conversion and you, like all you wanted to do was tell everybody uh, about Jesus? Yeah, I was that really annoying friend to my parents, all my Jewish friends, uh, and I, still, I continue to annoy people in various ways. <laughs> so you, you mentioned something earlier uh, on about how uh, your friends and your family were like, what's wrong with you? You know, wh what happened? You know, um, in, in kind of a, a Jewish community or family context, you know, like the fact that Christians claim Jesus's Jewishness and Jewish identity, like how does that kind of go over? You know, like, is it like, it seems to be problematic, you know, uh, how, 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 are those tensions felt, you know, in the community, or how how are they responded to? You? No, that's a great question. Okay, so how the tensions between Jesus being Jewish versus Jesus being like part of a separate religion? Yeah. Kind of, mm, I don't even. I can't say. Like, is Jesus a bad Jew? You know, is he? Oh. You know, like, or was he a good Jew, and then we just you know claim him to be something bigger than he 
really, in, he was just this rabbi, good teacher, you know, and then Christians took it off and, yeah. and changed, you know, the script a little bit. I think everything you've just said, I've probably heard at least one Jewish person say. Okay. There's not like one Jewish party line on anything, right? Like Anglicans, everybody doesn't always believe the same thing, right? Or even if you're supposed to. Uh, the same. It's like isn't, the, there that, isn't there like a uh, saying about like if, two Jews, three opinions? Yeah, exactly. Kind of a yeah. Thing. Yes, yeah, I think so. a lot of people will say that about their own background. Yeah. But I, I, I hope I think we invented it. Yeah. Um, I think the things that I've heard the most are. Um, I've I've hardly ever heard any Jewish people say anything bad about Jesus himself. Jesus was good. He was a good Jew, a good Jewish teacher, maybe even a prophet, um, but not the Messiah. And Paul is often designated as the bad guy. Okay. Paul's the one who made, who, Paul, Paul's the, the, the bad cop. Jesus is the good cop. Um, Paul's the one who taught anti-Jewish things, who said the law is no good, the Torah is no good, uh, stop keeping them. And, um, but Jesus you'll hardly ever hear anything too bad about. And the fact that he's Jewish sometimes seems sort of incidental, uh, and sometimes kind of seems like, yeah, he's Jewish. Okay, well, I don't really understand uh, what Christians believe, but he's not the Messiah because if he if he were the Messiah, if a Jewish person even believes in the Messiah, so that's a big if. But if he were the Messiah, there would be peace. Um, a lot of the the Old Testament scriptures say things like, "Nations shall not lift up sword against nation; neither shall people learn war anymore. The wolf will lie down with the lamb." Well, I walk outside, I see a lot of wolves and lambs. Uh, that aren't getting along. Hmm. In the US, we call them Democrats and Republicans. Can I say that? <laughs> no. Um, but in general, I, I was afraid that was going to come out. Um, in general, there's no peace. So, how could, if Jesus is the Messiah, where's the peace? And then, you know, we have to redefine peace. How did it come? What kind of peace are we talking about that Jesus brings? Yeah, maybe along the lines of the political dimension of Jesus' identity. Um, I guess in kind of extreme forms of anti-Semitism in the states, you know, with right-wing radical yeah. groups that still claim some kind of Christian identity. Yeah. You know, what what's lost? I, I like maybe we start in the extreme sense. What's lost by not acknowledging Jesus's Jewishness, um, and uh, mm. and then maybe bringing it back into a more moderate form of, you know, a kind of a a whitewashing of Jesus in a sense, or a, you know, uh, Americanizing Jesus, you know. Um, so what, what, what do we lose when we, when we don't understand Jesus's Jewishness, you know? Okay, since you brought up the extreme example, let me start there. Yeah, Thanks. let's start there. And yeah. then I'll come, but you might need to, you know, drag me back okay. to the rest of it. That's probably <laughs> interesting, so let's stay there as long as we need to. So. Well, just, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about what happened at, uh, I was teaching, uh, my classes towards the end of fall semester, you had all this Kanye West stuff going on with, with the Jews, and I was sort of following it on Twitter and um, was very upset, you know, by, by um, the extent of the anti Semitism that I was seeing um, on Twitter. And so there was one day when someone actually, it was in, in Los Angeles, and I was interested in this because I used to live in LA, someone hung a banner across the LA freeway, an LA freeway overpass that said, uh, Kanye was right about the Jews, and then it said John 844 and Revelation, what is it, 326, might be 329, something like that. And so I thought, okay, this is terrible, I'm gonna use this as a teaching moment in my class, captured a, a screenshot of that and put it up on the, um, you know, on, in, in a PowerPoint. Uh, and, you know, people were doing like a, a Hitler salute. And they're using the New Testament. Because, you know, that's one thing I'm trying to teach them. This is like really an easy one. How can you tell when the New Testament is taken out of context? You know, it's not usually this easy. Um, this is a pretty easy one. Anybody know what John 8.44 says? I would ask the class. And then I would say, okay, this is where Jesus says to a group of Jews who are you know, pressing him for, uh, they're arguing with him, saying, no, you're not the Messiah. Uh, you are of your father, the devil. And ever since then, uh, Jews, you know, that one scripture is used to do a lot of bad things, um, to claim that Jews are, are, are children of the devil. To this day, 
when I don't really, you know, even in its context, Jesus is not saying all Jews are of the devil. So uh, the other, the revelation scripture was uh, just about the synagogue of Satan. But I, that's the, that is what I see, you know, more than anything. You're using the New Testament to say that Jews are of the devil. Um, yeah, that's a problem. Um, another quick story. Uh, my mother graduated from college when I was, I think, in ninth grade. And she was at this college maybe an hour from our house. And she was taking some class. And in the middle of a class break, the students are in the hallway. And she sees this woman like walking around her in circles, kind of like looking at her. And finally, my, my mom says, oh, are you looking for my horns? And the woman says, yeah, I was. She's like, oh, no, we don't have those. Uh, and I, I actually told that story once in my class. You know, someone had been taught that Jews have horns, and some of that goes back to you are of your father, the devil, and some of it has to go back. I think there's a, a statue of Moses with horns. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Okay. So well, a Jewish student, uh, you know, a 20-year-old in one of my classes said, oh, yeah, that happened to me once, which shocked me because, you know, this is... You know, at the time it was like 2020. I didn't think that happened anymore. So that's that's pretty extreme. Um, most people, to, I'm pulling myself back in now. Most people know Jesus was Jewish, but I think part of your question is, how should that affect how Christians understand? Does it even Jesus? matter? You know, does it yeah. matter if he was Jewish or not? I mean, and I think my extreme example shows, yeah, it does because Jesus himself would would never ever approve of that kind of use of, of the New Testament or of scripture. Um, I think the Jewishness of Jesus would be great if it were better understood by me and by, by most of us uh, who, know, who know Jesus and who, who, um, who love the Bible. Um, one, of the, one book that I would really recommend by uh, Dr. Amy Jo Levine, maybe some of you have heard of her, it's called The Misunderstood Jew, subtitle, um, um, the Scandal of the Jewish Jesus in the Church, something like that. It's a short book, it's under $20, and um, it's got just so many riches and so much great uh, material in it. And it's easy to read. It's kind of pitched at a high-level lay audience. So some of the ideas that I'll probably share with you tonight, I've stolen from that book. And, and, and uh, I, I talked to her recently. She said, oh, yeah, fine, as long as you tell them about the book. Uh, <laughs> So things like, you know, Jesus, let's say, dressed like a Jew, prayed like a Jew, uh, ate like a Jew, taught like a Jew. Well, what do I mean by that? Um, the way he dressed. So uh, a woman comes up to him at one point, uh, who's, who's the hemorrhaging woman, and uh, touches the fringe of his garment. Well, what are, what are, what's she talking about? Why, why is he having... Why does he have fringes on his garments? Because that's what Jewish males wore, and some still do to this day. They're called, in Hebrew, they're called tzitzit. Anybody ever heard of that? Tzitzit. So it's, you know, uh, it's commanded in Numbers 15 that you wear these fringes uh, with, with like a, a thread of blue in them that are supposed to remind you of the covenant between Israel and God and of the commandments. Uh, and Jesus wore them, as I'm assuming, you know, all of the disciples probably did. So the woman touches uh, the fringe of his garments and is, is healed. Jesus does criticize the Pharisees for, if you remember this section, for lengthening uh, their fringes, for making them an ostentatious show. But he never says, stop wearing them. Uh, so he obviously still did, you know, probably dress exactly like uh, Jewish males uh, dressed in his day. Uh, let's see, what else can I say about that? Hmm. We can go on to Jesus' diet, perhaps. Did, he, did Jesus ever stop keeping Jewish dietary laws? Um, what are the Jewish dietary laws? What, what are things the Jews don't eat? Religious Jews don't eat. Pork, shellfish, uh, anything, any mammal that doesn't have a split hoof or chew its cud, any, any sea creature that doesn't have a, uh, that has an external skeleton, lobster, shrimp, crab, yeah, not kosher. Uh, 
Jesus never, okay, Mark 7 has Jesus, uh, Jesus never says, uh, I'm gonna change everyone's diet now. Mark says Jesus declared all foods clean, but Matthew never actually has that, that statement. Um, I think that there are some really good arguments that Jesus always assumed that Jews would continue to eat, to keep the dietary laws even when they followed him. One really good argument, I think, is um, if, you remember Acts chapter 10 where Peter has the vision when he's with Cornelius and the sheep comes down with all these un, unclean animals, and one of the things Peter says is, uh, no, Lord, but I've never eaten any unclean animal. Well, Peter spent quite a bit of time with Jesus. If Jesus had said, okay, you can go ahead and eat anything you want, you would think Peter would have known about it. And you also wouldn't have had the food fight of Galatians 2, where uh, all this disagreement between Peter and Paul about what people ate. So, you know, Jesus probably kept kosher. Uh, what else? Jesus taught that the greatest commandment was, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Uh, that is the Shema. That's like the first prayer a Jewish kid learns uh, when they're like two or three years old. So it's still the heart of, the heart of Judaism. If you probably asked any rabbi today, they would tell you the same thing. That is the heart of the Jewish teaching. That's, you know, love God. And the, and the second commandment, he didn't stop there, love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love your neighbor. That's, that's uh, the, all the law and the prophets rests on those two commandments. You really can't get more Jewish than that. Uh, and you know what else? Sometimes I was sort of disappointed to learn this, but like Jesus didn't invent that idea. Uh, it's, it's, you can find it in other Jewish writings. But Jesus doesn't have to be unique to be profound. Uh, he can still be, you know, a great Jewish teacher. Uh, he, can, he can be more than a great Jewish teacher, but he still has to be a Jewish teacher. Um, so his teaching was Jewish. Seemed to keep the law. Um, one, you know, one of the big misconce misconceptions I find that some Christians have about Judaism is that the law is a terrible burden for the Jewish people to keep. Uh, I've, I heard that my very first time I ever went to church, I went to Sunday school, and there was this really smart guy teaching on Galatians and talking about how horrible the law was to keep. And I remember thinking, okay, well, I need to listen to this guy because I was obviously wrong about Jesus. Uh, I must be wrong about everything. And I kind of imbibed a lot of that and then had to kind of relearn that, no, um, uh, the law, most Jews do not really understand the law to be this big, terrible burden. Uh, Psalm, what is it, 119, the law of the Lord. Uh, okay, I was about to quote a, a, a passage and I was not prepared to quote it. The law, what, how does it go? The law of the Lord is what? Okay, you guys can't quote it either. Perfect, like maybe converting the soul, is that the, the second part of it? Okay, it's all coming back to me now, thank you. I, that was a plant in the audience I put there. Um, Jews love the law. So it wasn't really this huge, uh, this huge burden. In fact, Jesus actually makes the law harder and not easier. You know what I'm thinking about? Yeah, the Sermon on the Mount definitely yeah. takes it to the next level, right? Yeah, the antithesis. Yeah. You've heard it said, but I say to you, you've heard it said, um, what's one example of that? You shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, if you even lust after a woman, uh, you've already committed adult. You're, you're liable for the same punishment. Uh, or thou shalt not murder. But I say to you, if you, if you hate someone, uh, you're liable to the, to, to the punishment. Well, that's not actually doing away with the law. That's actually making the law harder to keep. Um, I can go through most days in my life not murdering someone. I'm pretty good. I think generally pretty good about that. But when I drive on the, <laughs> on the St. Louis freeways, uh, to get to school, I've got like an 18-mile drive in the morning. You know, sometimes I have bad thoughts about other drivers. Uh, Jesus doesn't like that. You know, it's hard to commit murder uh, if you're not hating someone. And then, you know, you've heard it say, said, love your neighbor, but no, uh, love your enemies and pray for them. He makes it harder. I think Jesus loved the Jewish law. He kept the Jewish law. He respected it, even if, even if many of these commandments were not intended for non-Jews. 
uh, at least there's a, a way to appreciate uh, uh, those laws and the Jewish scriptures. So you kind of take a breath now. Okay, you can take a drink if you want. Okay, like. thanks. Um, so I'll ask a long question so you have time to take a few sips. But um, so you kind of referred a little bit uh, to the spat between Peter and Paul. And maybe we can just expand that idea a little bit. So uh, obviously some of it was around the Gentiles having, being required to follow some of the kind of Jewish laws and covenantal rituals. Um, but maybe we can talk a little bit about this idea that somehow the church and Christianity supplanted mm. Judaism and, it's, and in some ways, in maybe the more extreme forms, it's the Jews had their chance, they missed out, and now, they, now it's time for something new. Or maybe in a, in a more generous way that, you know, this is really a fulfillment of everything that was there. But the church still, in some ways, uh, supersedes, you know, kind of the Jewish covenant and this new covenant in Christ, you know, replaces that covenant. Um, how do you kind of approach that theology or how have you wrestled with that, those kinds of ideas that are um, prominent in, uh, in kind of Christian circles, especially in North America today? And a follow-up question, maybe you want to tie it in, is uh, what is the church's relationship to Judaism today because of some of the theological implications of that. Okay, so why are you throwing me these softball questions? Can't you think of something harder to ask? Um, wow, that's a lot. Uh, it's something I have thought about a lot. It's not something I've really ever researched or studied, but I remember when I'd been um, a believer maybe uh, six months, I remember asking someone, so tell me, is the church Israel or not? I really need to know, like what, what's going on? How does this work? Uh, and, and the person uh, told me, uh, Lori, you know, first, before, those are, that's a really good question, but first, you know, take some time and just learn to love Jesus. And I was like, okay, but I really want to know. <laughs> um, there's, I think, a lot of mystery, and I'm, this is not a cop-out, because I'll get into some details. There's a lot of mystery around the relationship between the church and the Jewish people. I don't know if anybody has all the answers. I know that I don't. Uh, I know some things that Paul said about it. Uh, I know that I, when, when I hear the idea that the church has replaced Israel and God's done with the Jewish people, I, I immediately you know, have a, a visceral reaction uh, against that idea. So, um, you know, when I read, especially I'm thinking Romans 9 to 11 is one of my favorite passages of the New Testament. And it sounds to me when I, you know, when I try to read Paul, and the times when I try to read Paul, I think Paul's wrestling with it. I think he's thinking as he's writing, and I don't think he even thinks uh, he's got all the answers. But he tries, and I gotta give him credit for that. Uh, I think that Paul believes that, the, that there is still something special about being Jewish, especially I'm thinking of, I think it's Romans 11, the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Like, God doesn't just take those things away. And he goes on to try to explain things in a way that's really, I think, hard to understand. You know, not all Israel are, all, are Israel. Some of Israel has, has been hardened. Some have stumbled. But guess what? I think Paul's talking to the church at Rome, mostly Gentiles. He's saying, guess what? You Gentiles, if that hadn't happened, if, if Israel had, had, hadn't had, you know, massive unbelief, you might not be here. Uh, that was your chance. It was like a window opened for you, a door opened for you to come in to the kingdom of God because of Jewish unbelief. And I think Paul's also dealing with boasting in Rome. You know, um, it's a long story, but uh, there, were, there were Jews and Gentiles. I think this is how I read it in the church in Rome. And at one point, the emperor Claudius, there's some evidence for this, kicked the Jews out of Rome because of some disturbances, and then Claudius the emperor dies somewhere around the year 54, I think. Jews start returning to Rome, and now the church is kind of like, no, wait a minute, we're in charge now. 
Uh, and so there's a certain way that there's, there's some disagreement between Jews and Gentiles. So Paul's trying to tell the Gentiles, look, settle down, uh, be grateful. You know, you were grafted into an olive tree that wasn't even yours from the beginning. You know, know your place. Uh, Israel were, are the natural branches. And, uh, you know, I'm not an agriculturalist, but I think that the analogy still works. Uh, you can graft something into a plant and it will grow on that plant. And Paul, that's how I think Paul sees Gentile Christians. But, you know, God can still graft those natural branches back in and God can break you off uh, if, you know, if you stumble. So, you know, I think Paul's just trying to say, you know, eventually all Israel will be saved. Wow, I want to know what that really means, what that really looks like. Uh, you know, that's part of the mystery. Um, the mystery of the kingdom of God. I can only try to explain the little bit of light that I think that I have about that. Uh, I think Paul thinks that there is going to be a massive influx of Jews following Jesus at some point in the near future when he's writing. There's some evidence, you know, that Paul thinks Jesus is going to come back before lunch. I mean, he doesn't think we're ever, he, does, he can't imagine us here at Wycliffe College 2,000 years later. That's why I think he tells people, don't even bother to get married, you know. Paul's, Paul's pretty weird. If you really re read 1 Corinthians 7, if you want to read some of the least appreciated weird things that Paul, you know, it's, it's okay, I guess. You can get married if you just can't handle it. You know, I wish you could be like me, but if you can't help yourselves, go ahead and get married. That's okay. Of course, later, you know, in 1 Timothy, uh, in the pastoral epistles, uh, Paul is saying, uh, Paul, can I do that, is saying, um, marriage is good, you all should get married. But early on, Paul is saying, no, um, only get married if you, if you can't stand it because the, this world as we know it is passing away. It's passing away, but here we are. Uh, so Paul's got this imminent eschatology, this apocalyptic worldview that we're not here very long. You don't have time to get a PhD uh, or you know, plan for the future. Uh, marriage, children, there's no time for that. Come on, join me in winning souls for the Lord. Uh, the time is short. Paul is weird. Uh, and I kind of love him for it. So the church is in Israel. They're related. They're not the same. Um, all Israel will be saved. Maybe, uh, maybe one practical implication. Um, we're, we're approaching Easter uh, soon, and mm. it's the time of year where my Facebook feed lights up and talks about how Christians shouldn't celebrate seders. Oh. And so, um, mm -hmm. so along with this kind of replacement mm -hmm. idea, you know, many Christians in my kind of background practice a Christian seder, which basically is a reinterpretation of many of the pieces in light of, of kind of Christian understanding of that being fulfilled in Jesus. Uh, how does the Christian Seder sit with you in its various forms? Uh, obviously, there's different kind of versions of it, but um, yeah, if people, how would you respond to both people that maybe want to celebrate that and find value and meaning in that and those who think that Christians shouldn't touch that and appropriate that in, in that kind of way. Yeah, thanks for asking that question. Uh, I'm being a little sarcastic. I actually, I started to think about that a little more uh, tonight uh, in conversation with the bishop. And I have really, you know, run the gamut of thoughts on Christian satyrs. So whatever I tell you tonight, just know it is uh, my view and my view only, and it may not be my view tomorrow. I, 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 I reserve the right to change my mind as I experience new things and learn new things. Um, you know, I used to give Passover presentations in churches, uh, not an actual Seder, but to explain the various elements of Passover and how it works and to show the connection to uh, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist. And uh, why shouldn't Christians learn those things? Uh, I think that's a great uh, it's, it's a great way to enhance your understanding of Judaism and of your own traditions. Uh, I think it makes the communion experience richer. I've also been involved in Christian seders that were for learning purposes. 
now I'm starting to think about there's a Jewish word called kavanah, which means intention. What intention are you doing uh, your, with, with your Seder? Do you think you're doing, the, are you doing the actual Jewish practice or are you doing it to learn and appreciate what your Jewish friends and neighbors uh, do and to understand the Jewish religion better? To me, like learning, there's nothing ever bad about learning. <laughs> Uh, and, and experience these things. And Passover is something that really is best understood by experiencing it. It's kind of the, I think, maybe his, Western history's first multimedia uh, experience. Passover is something that you taste, that you smell, that you hear, uh, that you sing. Uh, there are all these different elements uh, involved in Passover. And it's maybe my favorite holiday of all holidays, Jewish and Christian combined, for some of those reasons. When do I think a Christian Seder might be an appropriation or maybe something? It, it can seem to some people not to be respectful. Uh, if you think that you are doing the actual Seder maybe on the night of the Seder and you are participating in, in, in that actual event, I'm, having, I'm, just, I'm really talking and I'm having a hard time saying that there's you know, anything really terrible or bad about it. You know, I, w I was trying to say uh, that celebrating as if you're a Jewish person, you know, that there is something kind of cringy uh, to me about that. But if you're doing it in, in, you know, in a way to learn how to respect and, uh, and appreciate Judaism, uh, that's fine. I, you know, I did one time, I was in Oregon giving Christ in the Passover presentations. This is maybe 30 or so years ago. And I show up maybe on a Maundy Thursday in a, a small town in the middle of Oregon. And all of these people have made a Passover meal. And the men are wearing yarmulkes, you know, like Jewish head coverings. And they made like matzo ball soup. And they, you know, I felt conflicted because I thought this is so sweet that they went to all this trouble. Um, and at the time, you know, it's something felt a little bit weird about it, but honestly, my overall feeling was, wow, like they really, they really put in a lot of work. Let me put it this way. I do follow some people on, um, I follow Jews and Christians of various stripes on Twitter, and I, I read some of their comments, and every once in a while I can't resist and make a little, and, and tweet, I've tweeted. I don't enjoy doing it because as soon as you say something on Twitter, someone's going to attack you. And I'm not really that good with criticism. But I have seen people really bash Christian satyrs and beg Christians not to do it because they feel like you're taking, you're taking our holiday uh, and you're turning it into something that it was never intended for. And I, I, can't say, I can't say that they're, that they're wrong completely. I can't say that they're wrong for feeling that. So I think if, you know, if you've been invited to a Seder or if you've thought about putting on one yourself, you know, talk to Jewish people, you know, learn as much as you can and ask yourself, you know, why am I doing this? What's the intent of my heart? Um, I would love to hear you know, people's comments or thoughts on that, but we can wait till the end. Yeah, I got one more question. It's not gonna be an easy one. But. Wait, let me, is this about Passover? No. Okay, let me just say something on a, in a different vein. You know what actually does offend me is that it used to be a Jewish thing that on Christmas, Jews would eat Chinese food and go to the movies. Because no, the Chinese food restaurants are open and Christians are all home opening presents. So it was like, this was like the thing that Jews did. In the past few years, I've seen Christians out eating Chinese food on Christmas and going to movies. And I'm like, that offends me. That was like our holiday. This was our chance to do something. Don't take our, don't eat our Chinese food on Christmas. That's, you know, eat ham, something that Jesus never ate. Uh, do, do, do Christmas, but leave us the Chinese food in the movies. I think that's good advice. Um, okay, so my last question, kind of there's maybe a little story tied to it. Um, I did some missionary work in Africa, and the first time I came back, I was sitting in a Wendy's and I was meeting up with a friend and I was talking about my experience, you know, doing mission work. And uh, someone came up to us after, or after we were chatting and we were like, oh, I heard you're a missionary and you're doing missionary work. And he's like, I'm a missionary too. And he went on to explain that he was part of this mission called Exabus. And the, this mission, Exabus, uh, the goal was to bus diaspora Jews from Europe down to uh, 
um, to Israel in order to hasten the second coming of Christ. Oy. And so after talking to the guy, it was really interesting. They weren't interested in converting Jews, but just getting them to, to Israel. Um, so Exabus. Exabus. I thought it was clever. It is you know, clever. Like from a marketing perspective, yeah. you know, yeah. like it is quite, good... quite, quite clever. But yeah. um, I, I guess what I want to kind of probe a little bit is this idea of the land, eschatology, Jewish identity, and how that all factors in. So like, you know, the Zionist movement, both within Judaism, but also within evangelical Christianity in particular, you know, the, this idea of Israel. How, as a church, should we align or not align ourselves with kind of some of the, the politics around, you know, the state and land that is called Israel now? And I, I know within the church, there's a lot, of, like, in the same way the Seder maybe is a small-scale, you know, uh, analog of that. But, you know, how should we kind of navigate the complexities of such a, a kind of a political hot potato? Okay, I thought I'd almost made it through the night without that question. Uh, now this is like a, this is almost, this is kind of a nightmare question for me, and I, I appreciate it, but I'm just saying, um, I, it, it's so, you just hit like the most complicated topic, I think one of the most complicated topics of our world today, and it's yeah. important. It's important. Um, again, there'd be a wide, variety of viewpoints that people would have on this. I grew up, you know, to love Israel, been there several times. I went as a teenager and had like one of the peak experiences of my life, spending a summer there uh, living with an Israeli family, with a bunch of my friends from St. Louis. My synagogue had a special program. We spent the summer, you know, I cried for weeks when I left. Uh, uh, I just, I felt such a kinship with the land and with the people. Um, hmm. So it's interesting, my roommate was Jewish, and his kind of network, they felt like, oh, it's not the real Israel because it was um. Christians that started it. So he had this kind of other, you know, take on it where it's like, no, no, it is our land, but our Messiah is going to, like, bring it, not, you know, some you know, people in Europe, you know, post-war. So this would be like a very, an ultra-Orthodox Jew might have that idea yeah. that the Messiah is supposed to bring about the true yeah. state of Israel and the land. Yeah, so he, yeah. he just didn't want anything to do with that because, you know, it was... Well, and there's a famous Jewish scholar, Daniel Boyarin, who is an a anti-Zionist and an ultra-Orthodox Jew, I think for different reasons. You know, um, I'll just give you my one little relatively insignificant thought on that. And that is, to me, what makes me Jewish is not a political state, but the idea of justice. And that's what the Hebrew prophets, you know, I read them a lot. Um, you know, take care of the poor, widows and orphans, leave a corner of your crops for the poor. Uh, it's not all about you. We've got like a social contract to take care of each other. Um, I have, you know, this is, again, this is just me. I have problems with the way things are going over there with people I know um, who have been there and, and tell me about the injustices that are, are happening to the Palestinian people. And if, if I, uh, Hel Rabbi Hillel said, if I am not for myself, who am I? If I am only for myself, what am I? And if I can't stand for uh, other people, it makes me think about, you know, the, the, uh, the people who stood idly by while J their Jewish neighbors were getting put into cattle cars and sent down train tracks uh, towards, towards death camps. I, I, I really struggle with, with that. And the way that I deal with that, though, I'm just, I'm being totally honest right here. The way I deal with it is mostly by not dealing with it. I'm busy. I'm a busy person. I teach. I grade. I get up every day, I worry about my mother. Um, but when it comes down to it, I can't, uh, I, I can't give that state my you know, unconditional support uh, because I feel like it would be betraying my Jewish values to do it. 
This is just me. I'm not standing for Messianic Jews for anybody except myself when I say that. And what advice would you kind of give Christians that aren't, you know, from a Jewish background, you know, as they kind of get pulled in, you know, either by, you know, their own theological, you know, positions or by kind of cultural forces, you know, at play? I mean, I have a theory about this, and I may be wrong, but um, I think many of us who are Jewish believers want to be accepted by the Jewish community very much, and we're not. And one way that we can join forces with the Jewish community is by supporting Israel. Um, and I'm very wary of that kind of support. I am a Zionist. I believe, I should say this, I believe Israel has a right to exist as a state. Um, I really feel like I shouldn't even be talking about this right now because I'm not an expert on the topic. But um, I don't think that, you know, we can take away other people's rights and homes and lives in the process. I think the best thing I, would t I could say to a Christian is learn about what's, what's happening. You know, educate yourself. Don't just listen to, quote, one side, but investigate it. Maybe even, you know, go there. Um, but go there, you know, I've had friends who have gone there and stayed in Palestinian villages, Christian pastors who I know, uh, one Mennonite pastor, a couple of Mennonite pastors. Uh, and they've come back, you know, really changed in, in their views of things. Well, even at supper, we were talking a little bit about the Jewish community in Iran post or pre-Islamic revolution. So, you know, Jews have lived, you know, peaceably, you know, yeah. with, you know, Muslim and, and Arab peoples, you know, in in past, and so maybe yeah. there is, it's not this kind of dichotomous, you know, future, you know, where it's either one way or the other. What would you kind of, what advice would you give to that man who is working for Exodus? I don't even think there's anything I could say to him. <laughs> uh, so he's trying to bring, I have trouble believing that a diaspora Jew is going to hop on that bus. Like how many people have even, have even done this, do you know? I didn't follow up with him because it was, yeah. it was more of a shocking experience, but um, I feel like, it, like the, he had invested in it and had been doing it, so obviously there maybe, maybe was some traction, but. Um. I, I just, I have, a tr I have trouble imagining that that's, gonna, that that's going to work out very well for him, so I think I would just let that, run its course. Yeah. Well, uh, would you help me in thanking uh, Dr. Laurie Williams? <laughs>